So Dr. Tosti, apart from being a radio, uh, he was apart from being a doctor, he was also a radio jockey for ten years. He has been associated with the specialty of emergency medicine for the last twenty years, and he is currently the vice president of medical operations for Red Health. For those, I think we see a lot of new faces here. So those of you who have joined, so Silver Talkies is a social impact organization. We believe age is just a number and we provide exciting opportunities to our members to learn, interact and engage. So every month we plan a variety of online sessions for our members. Apart from that, we organize physical meetups. We plan international and domestic travel. We offer volunteer support and also give our members the opportunity to write for our digital magazine. Our vision over here is to build a society where older adults can age gracefully with empowerment and dignity. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. And thank you, Dr. Tosi, for taking out the time for our members. And before I hand it over to Dr. Tosi, uh, I would please request everyone to remain uh, be on mute. And if you have any questions, uh, please put it in the chat box. And to Thank you, Rushika. As always, a pleasure to be back here. This is a very, very vibrant uh, community of people. And of course, more than my presentation, the question and answer session that happens, that extends longer than my presentation, which I really enjoy a lot. Uh, today, for a change, this is not a, a very uh, serious topic. And I'll tell you why I'm saying it's not a serious topic. Growing up as a child and after I've become a doctor and practiced um, by God's grace for quite a few number, number of years, I've realized there is a lot of truth to the home remedies that our grandmothers tell us and then that is passed on to our mothers as well. So a lot of the home remedies that have been taught to us by our elders actually work, right? So... Um, what I'm looking forward to is, as we go through different scenarios, emergency scenarios that can happen at home, uh, feel free to say, no, 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 this is what will work or this will not work. Uh, we used to do it like this. It'll make for a very, very healthy, vibrant conversation. And well, the topic today is first response for the elderly, and it's how to be a silver savior. I'm sorry, I'm not saying silver talk easier. <laughs> All right. So how to be a silver savior. This is for all of you who are at home and are all, all, already experts at home remedies. But what does the medical world say? And if you like the medical world, then maybe you can imbibe a few of these remedies into your home remedies. Okay. So without wasting any time, I'm going to go into a lot of scenarios, tell you the scenario, and then what would be the right approach in this scenario. Okay. So the first and foremost is this kind of an oh my god kind of a scenario right this is this could happen to anybody yes uh, you know we i'm the, the first image the guy in the coat and suit is is an actor who is pretending to have collapsed inside an office but that is a scenario that could happen to everybody and of course the other picture is a real time uh, thing that has happened football players collapsing on the ground football players are considered one of the fittest group of athletes but if they themselves are collapsing on the ground, if anybody of you is a big football fan and we're watching uh, Euro 2022, uh, one of the best footballers in the world from Denmark, Christian Eriksen, also collapsed on the ground. And then they treated him and luckily he survived today and he's doing well. And he came back to play a few football matches as well. And this has happened before as well. But the same situation about 10 years ago happened in India on a football field a young 27-year-old uh, player uh, in Kolkata, Eden Gardens, but we couldn't save him because the people around him didn't know exactly what to do. Okay, Of course, now things have changed. Whenever there is a sporting event, it is mandated to have an ambulance and paramedical staff in that event. So what do we do? Somebody calls you, oh, please come, come, come. You know, somebody in my house has collapsed. Can you help them? Right. So the first thing we're going to discuss is basic life support. As you notice, the caregivers here are uh, older people, right? These are not youngsters who are giving uh, CPR. So if you practice, you might be able to give CPR. Of course, the most difficult part of all of this is chest compression. That's the tough part to do, the tough thing to do. I'll try and show you a video on how chest compression is done. But you can give mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and you can definitely deliver a shock. And I'll tell you how that works, okay? Right. 
So there are a certain uh, few number of steps when you decide that you are going to save somebody's life. Basic life support is primarily when it's just you and the person who's there and there is no medicine, there is no ambulance, there is no fancy equipment, nothing is there. It's just you and the person. So how do you decide to save that life, right? If, if we were able to discuss, I would have asked you, what do you think would be the first thing to do when somebody is unconscious, right? A lot of us think we should give them some water, uh, give them some uh, air, fresh air, right um, and sometimes we say okay make them lie down in a, in a cool place some of these are some of the things that you uh, think should be done correct now what is the right thing to do the way we remember it is there are three steps before you start saving their life and three steps during saving their life okay so what are the first three steps before you start saving their life the first step is safety whose safety are we talking about we're talking about your safety, the rescuer's safety. If you notice this picture here, this gentleman, this painter is actually painting safety first, but he himself is not being safe. This is a problem we all have. For instance, when you're taking a flight, the flight attendant will tell you when there is a drop in cabin pressure and the oxygen mask falls down. If there are children traveling with you, you put the mask on for yourself first and then for the children. Why is this being said? Because our natural tendency as a human being is to protect our children first. We have a very strong protective streak. What happens is by the time you put mask for one child, you yourself might become unconscious. And then who's going to help the other children and you? So you have to put it on first so you can help as many number of people as, as you want once you are safe. This is the same idea. For instance, somebody has had an accident and they've fallen on the road. You cannot go give CPR on the road. You have to move them to the side of the road. For instance, somebody has had an electric shock. You have to be very careful because the moment you touch that person, there, if the charge is still connected to that person, there's a very high chance that you might get the shock yourself. So safety is the first thing we always teach when we are teaching life support. The first step is safety. What is the next step? It is assess response, right? You have to go shake them gently and shout loudly so that even if they are asleep, they should be able to hear you. I mean, if somebody's, you know, probably had a great evening and then they are just, you know, sleeping off all the fun uh, elements that might have entered them, all the liquid courage, they might be just enjoying a very deep sleep. And you go start giving them CPR, it's going to be an unpleasant experience for them as well as for you, right? So the first thing is to find out if, they are actually, uh, you know, uh, unconscious and not able to respond or, or are they just asleep and they kind of do some moaning or show some signs of response. That's very important. So what we always say is shake gently, shout loudly. Are you okay? Are you okay? You have to shout so that even when they are asleep, they should be able to wake up and hear you. Somebody shouting near me, right? The reason why we say shake gently is especially for people who fall down. When people fall down, the neck is at a high risk of getting injured, right? So when you shake too much, the neck will shake a lot. And then the spinal cord, if it is not already injured, can get injured again. And if the spinal cord is injured, then they cannot move their uh, arms or legs. And that's a dangerous thing. So we don't, you know, shake them vigorously. It's shake gently and shout loudly, right? So that's, that's how you assess the response. This is step two, right? So you first ensured you were safe, then you assessed whether they are able to respond to you or not, and then you look at them. The third step is to look at them. Look at their chest rise and see if it is rising and falling, rising and falling. Are they breathing or not breathing? This is most important, okay? So first to know, if this unconscious person, are they breathing or not breathing? If they are not breathing, this is a condition that we call cardiac arrest. This is very different from a heart attack. Okay, A heart attack patient can be conscious or unconscious. Right, A heart attack patient can be actively conscious and complaining of chest pain. Oh, my chest, it's hurt, it hurts. This is a heart attack. A cardiac arrest is always an unconscious patient whose heart has stopped beating. 
This is the difference between a heart attack and a cardiac arrest. A heart attack can lead to a cardiac arrest, but they are not one and the same thing, right? A cardiac arrest is where somebody's heart has stopped pumping blood to the rest of the body. A heart attack is blood not reaching the heart, so they have chest pain. Okay, so they're different things. So here, this is a cardiac arrest. So what is the third step? See if they are breathing. If they're not breathing, call for help is very important, right? Assess, scene safety, assess response, call for help. Why? Because you may start CPR and you probably will be very good at it. I might be the best emergency physician in the world, but there is only so much human endurance that I will have. I can only give compression or breathing for so long time, so such a period of time. And then somebody else has to come and help me. So before you start the treatment, you call for help. This is very important. If there's an ambulance service that you know or know of, you call, ask the ambulance service to come. If no, there is a neighbor who's there, you call the neighbor or, or some other person who you think can help and then ask for more help, mm -hmm. right? So you call for help. Now, if you're calling an ambulance service, there is something you can ask for. It's called a defibrillator. Simply put, a defibrillator is a shock giving machine. So if you can't remember defibrillator, you can either remember it as a defib, that's also acceptable medical term, a defib, like refrigerator is a fridge. So defibrillator is a defib, or you can say shock device. Okay, so it's a shock delivering device. And I will talk about it a little later as we go down. Okay, so this is a shock delivering device and you can ask them to bring it if they already have it, right? And in certain malls and, and hospitals, and uh, so hospitals of course, but certain malls and railway stations and aer airports, it is now being mandated to keep AED, automated external defibrillator, which even you can use. Like I said, you can also deliver a shock safely without harming anybody. Okay. So these are the three steps before starting treatment. Safety, assess response, call for help. This is what you have to remember, okay? Now you've decided, oh, this person is unconscious, not breathing, heart is not pumping, I need to help them. So how do I help them, okay? Chest compressions. This is the most difficult part of giving CPR. It requires a reasonable amount of fitness, okay? Unless you have practiced this over and over again, it becomes difficult to give this for long periods of time. Okay. So where do you give these chest compressions which you see in the movie where they are pressing the heart? You have to find the center of the chest. For men, it's very easy. It is in between the two nipples, the center of the chest. Center of the chest. For women, you can keep it to the center of the chest itself and a rough area where you feel just where it is the mid chest. So at the mid chest, you have to give these compressions. That's the point that you want to give compressions at. Okay, this is your exact point. Now, this is how you interlock your hands. So you take your dominant hand and interlock with the other hand. Okay, whichever is your dominant hand, could be left or right. You take your dominant hand and interlock with this. And you place the palm, not the fingers, you place the palm on the midpoint that we just discussed. You place the palm on the midpoint, like this lady is placing on this person's chest. That's how you place it, okay? And then you give the compression. So the compression should be moving at your hip. Your entire body should come down like a hammer, okay? Like a hammer, it's your entire body. No, you shouldn't be giving through your hands because then you get tired very fast or your upper back. You should be giving from the hip like completely pressing on. Like when you do, when you're rocking children, how you bring your hip in front, that's how you're going to do it. So you're going to do that. Keep your hands absolutely straight. Your elbows should not be bent. And then you start the compression. So the person who's giving the, the rescuer will be looking at the person's shoulder, the victim's shoulder. And the victim's face should be looking at the rescuer's shoulder. That's how straight you should be. Okay. This is how we give chest compressions. And we have a count. It's like music. So we go one and two and three and four and five and six. That's the speed we go for about 30 uh, repetitions. Okay. One and two and three and four and five and six. And that's the speed you want because you want the heart to press and come up again and blood to fill. And then it'll go again. 
So you go 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 till 30. And you stop. Okay? This is the first treatment step. Chest compressions. When we say basic life support, it is C, A, B. And then D. Not A, B, C. It's C, A, B, D. Okay? So we're turning around the ABC a little bit. So C is chest compression, A is opening the airway, B is giving them a breath, okay? So I'm, I'm going to see if I can play a quick video for you to be able to see how chest compressions are done. To give CPR, I don't think this you can is what hear to do. The, voice. the casualty should be lying Just on their back the on a firm surface. There's no need to remove any clothing. Kneel beside them, level with their chest. Tilt their head back to keep their airway open. Lean over the casualty with your arms straight. So Place no the to heel the of one of your hands in the center of their chest there you go. in line center with their the nipples. Put the palm. Place the heel of your other hand on top of your first hand and interlock your fingers. Try to keep your hands away from their rib cage so you won't be pressing down on the casualty's ribs. So what they're saying is don't Keeping put it on your the arms ribs straight, because you will press break down the ribs. vertically Always about be the four to six of the centimeters, chest. which is about a third of the depth of the chest. So press about Release four to six centimeters. without removing your hands from their chest. Allow their chest to come back up fully. This is one compression before giving the next compression. So compress press, their chest release. 30 times press, at a rate of release. about twice per press, second. Release. This is roughly the speed of the BG song is staying alive. Give two rescue breaths. So if, if you have been able to actually hear the video, he, at the end of it, he says, the rhythm is similar to the Bee Gees song, Staying Alive. Ah, 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 staying alive, staying alive. So this is just like that. So one and two and three and four. And we love this music. We just love this music as emergency physicians because we know we're saving lives. Okay? Yes? So this is about how to give chest compressions, right? At some point, if I get to meet you face to face, I'll bring a nice mannequin, easy to press, and all of you can have a go at it at one fine day. Okay, for now, it's just a visual representation for you to understand what is to be done. So that's what you're stay, saying. The speed is at least 100 a minute. Don't worry about all these things. You just have to make sure they go in up to at least four to six centimeters. And, uh, and then you release fully. And you should go at the same rate that I talked about, one and two and three and four and five, right? Up to 30 times. So then you've taken care of the chest compression. You have, you know, made sure that you are pushing blood to the brain. So as you press the heart, the blood is going to the brain. And that's what will help them survive. And if there are two of you, please rotate every two minutes. Because like I said, this is the most difficult, physically demanding step. And it tires you out very fast. You can even rotate every one minute. You know, if you find it very tiring, that doesn't matter. But as long as you're able to continue to give it, it's simple. Right. Okay, do. So then airway. So we finish the C, then the A. What happens when somebody becomes unconscious is the tongue falls back. So you, that's what happens, right? So it blocks the air from going in. So you have to tilt, head tilt a little bit so that the tongue gets lifted up. So don't give the breath in the same position that they are. Tilt the chin up a little bit and then you give the breath. Okay, we call it as a head tilt and chin lift. So put your hand here and, and press down, two fingers here on the bone and pull up, right? So head tilt, chin lift, and then the airway is open. Okay, so once you open the airway, then you take a nice deep breath. And then cover their mouth, use your fingers to pinch the nose and blow. And how should you blow? Not, <laughs> no, that's what you do when there's something in your eye. You have to blow <laughs> over one second, okay? Over one second, you have to blow. And then you see. And then again, you blow over one second. So you give two breaths, 30 compressions, two breaths. And this is the magic number. 30 is to 2. 30 is to 2. And you keep repeating this, repeating this, repeating this till help arrives. Now, when help arrives, there'll be trained people who are coming. Uh, uh, this is about responsive patient, right? This is uh, this is about, I'm not talking about the shock kit. It'll come in the next slide. I think there was a slide skipped like that. But this is in case you checked. 
right? In case you checked and the person was breathing, you went and assessed response. Hello, are you okay? Are you okay? And I said, oh, I'm uh, mm, moaning, right? Then what do you do? You don't give CPR. You check them for injuries, but it's because it's not normal for somebody to be lying on the ground. You call for help and you put them in the recovery position. So what is a recovery position? If somebody is unconscious, what is the best recovery position? So we call this a Tata Bye Bye position. Okay. So you take one hand. If you want them to turn to the left side, you take one hand as a Tata Bye Bye. You take the other hand and place it under the person's chin, like it shows in step two. Then you fold the knee on the opposite side, on the same side as the hand that you put under the chin. And then you roll them towards the hand that was saying Tata Bye. Okay. And it's very simple, although it seems complicated. Ultimately, it is how you sleep every night. You just have to put them in a position like you sleep every night. The leg is a lock, so they don't roll back. And then you leave them. And every two minutes, keep checking to see if they're still breathing. If they stop breathing, you start CPR. If they're still breathing, then they're okay. This is called a recovery position. This is the position that you put people in when they're unconscious but breathing. Why this position? Supposing they vomit, if they're lying down straight, there's a tendency that they will aspirate. Here, even if they vomit or the secretions will all go on the side and the tongue will not fall back. So it's not going to obstruct the airway. That is why you put them on a recovery position, which is a left or a right lateral position, as we call it. Okay. Easy to remember that that's how we sleep every night. So that's how you're supposed to put them. Okay. Simple reason why our parents are always telling us, don't sleep on your back, don't sleep on your tummy. You have to always sleep on the side. And, and this is the reason why. Right? Okay, are we good so far? Interesting? Not interesting? All right, good. Yay, I'm happy. Excellent. Okay, and this is the shock machine. Now, you can become super experts by just knowing how to use an AED, Automated External defibrillator aed right so when somebody collapses when any adult human being has a cardiac arrest 50 percent of the time their heart is standstill that's flat line which you see on the monitor when you know in the movies they show a flat line that stands still there's only in 50 percent of the time the remaining 50 percent of the time the heart is dancing it's a dancing heart instead of pumping like this it's dancing dancing right so the heart is dancing so if one of our friends starts jumping around the room and we tell them they don't listen, what do we do? One tight slap, right? This is what we do to the heart as well. The heart is dancing and not pumping. So we say, and then we hope that it'll come to its senses and start pumping again. Okay, this is the, the job of a defibrillator. What an AED does is when you connect an AED to a patient, it by itself decides whether they are in the 50% who don't need a shock or 50% who will benefit from a shock. And it will tell you shock advised, deliver shock. All you have to do is press the button. Simple. Any non-medical person can do this. They just need to know how to switch it on and where to put the pads, right? For instance, in this picture, as you can see, we put one pad, sorry, one pad here on the right, just below the collarbone, okay? And then one pad here, left, just below the nipple. Why? Because the heart is in the middle. So we are putting one pad above the heart and one pad below the heart. So when the electricity discharges, it can go across the heart. Okay. This is all that you need to know, where to put the pads. And to make life easier for you, there's also a diagram on it which says where to put the pad. So don't be afraid to use the AD. Switch it on. Put the pad on the person. But of course, you have to do it on skin. You can't do it on top of clothes. You have to put it on the skin, one under the right collarbone, one under the left nipple, and then wait for the machine to analyze and tell you whether you, should need, you need to deliver a shock or not. If there's no need to deliver a shock, the machine will say, shock not advice, continue CPR. If it says, you know, deliver shock, you give the shock. You might actually save people's life. Why? When there is a dancing heart, what happens is if you give the shock within one to two minutes, you can save 100% of people. Like out of 100, you can save 100. But if you give it after 10 minutes, you might only save 10 people out of 100. 
only 10% you can say. So that's why when you made that call and asked for help, you said, please bring a defib or a shock device. Okay, that's why you asked for it. So this is how you do basic life support. Three steps before treatment, three steps during treatment. Three steps before treatment, safety, your safety, and then the patient or victim safety. Assess response, call for help. Then three steps of treatment, chest compression, airway and breathing, and then defibrillation. Okay, that's it. I mean, sometimes you won't get the AAD, so don't worry about it. Then you do just the CAB. There won't be a D. Okay, so that's the idea. Is that simple? Is that easy? All right. That's how easy it is to save lives, provided you know what to do. Okay, right. So, of course, you don't need to give rescue breaths also. Right? Why am I saying this? Sometimes when somebody collapses, there could be blood on the mouth. There could be secretions on the mouth. You might not want to give that mouth to mouth. Right? So, it's still okay to just give chest compression. You can save life by just giving chest compressions also. You don't need to give rescue breaths. Okay? So the chest compression is the most important step followed by giving the shock. So just by giving the chest compression, you can save life. If you don't want to give mouth to mouth, don't hesitate to resuscitate somebody. You don't have to give mouth to mouth resuscitation. Okay? And anybody tells you, oh, who told you that? Well, it's not me. It's the American Heart Association. Okay, it's not me. They have done a lot of studies which say that survival rates are equally good if you just give chest compressions and you're not giving mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Yes? Okay? Are we good? All right. Yay. So I'm going to move on now. And we're going to go to conscious people. Even conscious people can have an emergency. So we're not now talking anymore about unconscious people in cardiac arrest. Normally at home, people are still conscious, but they have certain emergencies. What can they be? Let's start off with the one that's the most dangerous, which is choking, right? So there are two passages, as you know. One is the air passage that's in the front. And then there is the foot pipe. The windpipe is in front. The foot pipe is at the back. And when you eat, the windpipe closes and food goes into the foot pipe. But if we have a habit of talking with our mouths full, the windpipe and foot pipe get confused. And then what happens is the food goes into the windpipe. And this is why our mothers and grandmothers always used to tell us, don't talk with your mouth full. Okay. This is why I keep saying home remedies are a lot more science than we will accept. Okay. So that's what is important. So don't talk with your mouth full is simply because then the food can slip into the air passage and that will cause choking. And this is the universal sign of choking. When somebody's choking, they cannot, more often than not, they cannot tell you that they're choking because the air passage is closed, right? So they cannot tell you, oh, I'm choking, like no sound. So they can only point saying, oh my God, I'm choking. So the moment somebody puts their hand there, you're going to think, mm, that's choking. The other way is, of course, inability to talk, noisy breathing, like snoring sounds are there, and the person's turning blue, right? And then they lose consciousness. Right. All of these are telling you that this person is not getting enough oxygen and they're choking. So what do we do in this situation? Yes. Yeah, you can, but not on the face. It's on the back. Yeah. <laughs> All right. OK. Yes. So you give five back blows. OK, five back blows. So how do you give these back blows? You make them spread their leg, lean slightly forward, go behind them and tap. Right in the middle, between the shoulder blades, you give back blows, two, 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 and try to get the object up. Then you can give five abdominal thrusts, what we call as the Heimlich maneuver, okay? So the Heimlich maneuver, as is seen in this picture, you stand behind the person, tip him slightly forwards, make a fist and put the other hand there, just below where the ribs end, you give tight thrusts, upward thrusts, inward and upward thrusts. So that will build pressure and try to push out the object. So back blows and then lean forward and abdominal thrusts. And this is called as the Heimlich maneuver. Okay. 
And then when you when it comes out, that's a great thing. If it's a small child, as the picture shows, you can kneel down and do the same thing, but apply a lot less pressure because otherwise a child's organs can get injured quite easily. But lesser pressure, but kneel down and then do the same thing. Okay. So this is important. If you're trying this, five back blows, five thrusts, five back blows, five thrusts, till the object comes out, in between, if they become unconscious, what do you do? You start CPR. Okay, so you don't wait, you start CPR. So when you're doing CPR, also the object can get pushed out. And the only difference is before you give the rescue breath, you open the mouth and see if there is an object there. And remove it if it is there. Okay, so that's how you treat choking. Is that all right? Are we good with choking? Five back blows and five abdominal thrusts. What if it's a baby? What if it's a little baby? All right. So a little baby, you make them lie on your hand. Use your knee for support. Put your hand on the knee and make sure the baby's face is between your fingers so that the neck doesn't shake around too much. And then the same back blows. Back blows. Rest them on the knee. Make sure you're holding their hand to stabilize it. Back blows. Back blows. Okay. So that's what you have to do. And then turn them around and use two finger. So here you're not doing a fist, just two finger, press under the sternum. Press, press to remove this out. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, so no fist here, just two fingers for babies. I mean, infants is what we're talking about. And same thing, repeat until, until the object comes out. Are we good? So far so good, is this useful? All right. Okay, good. I'm glad. Okay, let's move on to some more common conditions. Cuts and scrapes. Oh, my God. That's, that happens to everybody. So what do we do if there is a cut or a scrape? Right? Very simple. The first dictum, stop the bleed. How do we stop the bleed? Gentle pressure. And if you want it to stop faster, elevate it above the heart. Whichever body part it is, if it's a hand or a leg, then elevate it above the heart. Then the blood flow to that region will come down and the blood will stop. It will stop bleeding faster, earlier, I mean to say. Okay. The one mistake that we always do is when we are compressing, we have this habit, wipe. Is it still bleeding? Wipe. Is it still bleeding? You shouldn't do that. That's the wrong thing to do. I'll tell you why. Because when there is bleeding and you're compressing, platelets inside your blood, they come and form a plug. They're trying to stop the bleeding by forming a plug. Every time you wipe, you're removing this plug. And again, they have to start from the beginning. Okay? So don't keep wiping and checking if it's still bleeding. Just press and hold for five minutes. It has to stop bleeding. If somebody's not having any bleeding disorders or they're not in any blood thinners, it has to stop bleeding. Even those are blood thinners, you can you know hold for about 20-30 minutes and then it might stop. Okay? If it's not stopping, hospital or a doctor, that's very, very important. That might be an important thing to do, okay? Now, once the bleeding has stopped, you can clean the wound, rinse it with clear water, preferably running water, okay? Running water is great. And if it is dirty, try and remove all the dirt and the particles that are there, okay? And you can give an antiseptic wash also if it is contaminated wound, meaning soil contamination or there was dirt around. In that case, you can use an antiseptic solution to wash it. So first thing is stop the bleed and clean the wound. And stopping the bleed, pressure is your best friend and you can raise it above the heart in case you want it to stop faster. Okay? Right. Now, after this, you can apply an antibiotic cream or ointment. Don't apply powder. Okay? What powder does is it will dry it up and not allow healing to happen faster. Right? And every time you remove a dressing, the powder will stick to the scab that has formed on top and pull it out. So ointment is always better. Use an ointment, antiseptic ointment. So what you should keep at home, not powders. Okay, And keep the wound covered. And remember, it takes about 48 hours for any infection to develop. If you cross the 48-hour window, then it's unlikely that you should be getting an infection. But in those 48 hours, you have to keep the wound covered. 48 to be safe for 72 hours. Okay. So don't leave the wound open for the first 48 to 72 hours unless a very small scrape and I mean a small cut and so on. Even that you can use a band aid. Yeah. 
Okay, are we good? Cuts and scrapes, right? Okay, if it is a deep wound, you have to get it stitched. No choice because the body cannot bring it back together and heal by itself. What are the signs of infection you have to look for? Pain, redness, and pus. Okay, redness and swelling, of course, go together. And pus discharge, yellow colored discharge. So pain, redness and swelling, and pus discharge is important. Tetanus toxoid, TT. When to get a TT? Okay. Um, unfortunately, the medical world has no treatment yet for tetanus. So we always get by by giving the vaccine, tetanus toxoid. But you don't need to give it every six months like people commonly think. You need to give it only once in five years. And that too, if it is a contaminated wound, meaning you got exposed to soil or mud, then you have to take a TT shot. If your last TT shot was within five, uh, it was beyond last five years, then you have to take it. But if your wound is not contaminated, it's a very clean wound, like it was a knife, no soil contamination, you're very sure. Then if you have taken a TT shot within the last 10 years, then you're good to go. Nothing to worry. But for safer side, Five years is the benchmark that you need to remember. Okay, If you have taken a TT shot within the last five years, there is no need for you to take a repeat TT, sh TT shot. Okay? Make sense? All right. If you have any questions at this, at the end, I'll be happy to answer all of them. Sprains. Okay? So we twist our ankles, you know, wrist, and then there's a swelling. No bones broken here, but definitely there's a ligament injury. The only thing you need to remember is rice. Okay, like rice, roti, wheat, it's rice. Rice stands for rest the injured limb. So give it rest. Ice the area 10 to 15 minutes, four to five times a day for up to two days. Okay. Compress the area. Either use a crep bandage or use one of the stockings that we get. And then compress the area because it supports and allows healing also. Doesn't allow unnecessary movement and elevate the limb above the heart level. So if it's a leg, then put a stool and have it, you know, elevated up. Why? It doesn't allow the edema or the swelling to form. So rice is what you have to remember. Rest, ice, compression, elevates. If you remember this, you can treat any sprain. Okay? So that's very, very simple for sprains. So there it is. This is burns. And uh, just a quick burn lesson for us burns are of three types first degree second degree and third degree okay and what i want you to remember is the skin has two layers one we call the epidermis and then the dermis epi is above so dermis is below and epidermis is above the dermis dermatologist it comes from the dermis okay so skin has two layers below which you get other tissue layers like connective tissue, soft tissue, and muscle and everything. Okay, the skin itself has two layers. If only the top layer it gets burned, that's the epidermis, which is what happens in a sunburn. Okay, a sunburn is a first degree burn. It becomes red, it is painful, but it heals on its own and no scar. Okay, so it takes about a, a week or 10 days and everything's gone, this fresh new skin. You sometimes don't even need any uh, any medicine other than moisturizing lotion. Okay, so first degree burns are harmless, nothing to worry about, no worries. Second degree burns, second degree burns are divided into two: partial thickness, full thickness. This is dermis burns. Partial thickness is only part of the dermis is burnt. That means when somebody puts their hand in hot water, the blistering that forms. That is a second degree partial thickness burn. Again, the blister will break, break and it will heal without any scar. But the moment it goes into full thickness burn or a third degree burn, then scarring happens. Admission, treatment, a lot of other issues happen. Okay, So that is the bad burn. But any up to first degree and first de second degree partial thickness burns are okay and they heal beautifully. Okay, so that's that's the idea about burns. So minor burns, like I said, are first degree burns and second degree burns, which are less than three inches in diameter. So small burns are minor. Anything bigger than this is major. Okay, meaning you have to be taking this person to a hospital. You can't be treating them at home. Okay, first degree burns, you get away with moisturizing lotion. Second degree burns, you use antiseptic ointments, what we 
one name I want you to remember in ointments for burns is Silverex. Not burn all, Silverex. Burn all may be effective. I'm not saying it's not a good medicine, but it's not allopathy. It is uh, herbal or Yunani medicine, and I'm not the expert on it. Okay. Silverex, silver chalkies, Silverex. Okay. So you have to remember Silverex for burns. Okay. That's the antiseptic ointment that we use for treating burns. Okay, so how do you handle mild burns? The first thing is cool the wound. Always hold it under running water. Don't immerse the part into a bucket of water because what happens is that will get absorbed and there'll be unnecessary swelling. Okay, so it's always under running water. You, you feel the burn, you put it under running water. Don't immerse it anywhere. Okay, and just loosely bandage it with some gauze that you may have at home, roller bandage. Why? Because when air touches on the skin, the burnt skin, it irritates. It causes a lot of pain, right? So you can just loosely bandage it. If you have some painkillers, you can take it. And Silverex, that's Silverex. TT, mm, um, unless the skin is damaged, I generally don't recommend TT, okay? But if the skin is intact, then no TT is required. Okay, but Silverex, yes, is a great ointment to have. Okay, doke. Um, call your nearest hospital if there is a major burn. Of course, this is an actor, so don't worry. That's just uh, makeup. I know I can see. <gasps> so don't worry about it. It's not that at all. Okay. So call your nearest hospital, arrange for an ambulance, and ensure that whatever burning material is there that is removed, they're still not in contact. Otherwise, it will continue to burn. And don't immerse in cold water. They will swell up and they will not survive. Okay. And if there are no signs of life, you can do CPR for them. And like I said, cover them with a moist, wet, wet bandage. If you do it with dry, it will stick. It's not dry. Wet bandage is what you have to do. And loose dressing, not tight dressing. Loose dressing is what is recommended for burns. Okay? So this is how we can handle burns. Okie doke. Things not to do. Don't use ice. Ice is bad. Ice delays healing. Okay? Somebody has a burn. Don't put them under ice. All the blood vessels will constrict. No blood supply, healing is delayed. Okay, no butter, no toothpaste, uh, Viko Vajradanti. No, don't do all that. That's not something we are recommending. But this is, I have said, fair and lovely. Yeah, I see a lot of people applying fair and lovely on burns. Not a great idea. Okay, so please don't do that. The blisters that are there in some burns. There are different schools of thought. Some people say break the blisters. Some people say don't break. I say don't break. Why? The blister will by itself break when the underlying skin starts growing. So why do you want to break it and unnecessarily expose the raw skin? So wait for the blisters to break by itself. This is very, very important. Animal bites. Okay, what do we do for animal bites? I'm sure some of you may have pets at home. Okay, so for minor wounds, it's different from deep wounds. Minor wounds barely break skin. No danger of rabies. You wash with soap and water. The one thing that the rabies virus does not like is soap and water, even more than Dettol or antiseptic solution. Okay? So animal bites, the first thing that you must do is soap and water wash. And then apply an antibiotic cream and cover with a light bandage. For deep wounds, again, first you have to stop the bleeding and then see a doctor. They will clean it and then they will stitch it. Okay? But if there is a risk of rabies, we must see a doctor immediately. How do I know if there is a risk of rabies or not? All animals, mammals, carry rabies virus in their mouth. And I mean dogs, cats, monkeys. Um, I, um, I don't know. Uh, I have to go back to the atlas and see what other animals exist. But yes, but rats don't. Rodents don't have. So you're okay. Rat bites, you don't are not at risk of rabies. But other mammals, you are at risk of rabies. This is simple. If you have a pet at home and you have given them an anti-rabies vaccine within the last one year, you're not at risk of rabies. But if you have not given the yearly shot of vaccine, then you are at risk for rabies. Number one. Number two, if it is an unprovoked bite, meaning you were just walking on the road and then this dog came running and bit you, high risk of rabies. But if you were walking and you accidentally stepped on a dog and then it bit you, unlikely to be rabies. Okay? So unprovoked bites, unvaccinated animals, these are high risk for rabies. 
vaccinated animals unprovoked by uh, provoked bites that's all right nothing to worry okay so this is important for you all to understand snake bites oh my god what to do with snake bites and we've been spoiled by our hindi tamil telugu all movies snake bite hero wants to make the hero and fall in love with her uh, him so snake will bite hero will go nom 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 and hero will fall in love this is the worst thing they could show my god the day i became a doctor i was shocked beyond belief i said by all my youth i mean young days i have grown up watching this thinking that's the truth that's so so such a wrong thing to do so that is absolutely not the right thing to do any form of bloodletting is not going to help the person uh, you know uh, be able to handle a snake bite okay right so let's see what are the right things to do first and foremost remain calm i have a very sad and tragic story to tell you there was a young doctor uh, who was doing his internship in stanley medical college for those of you from chennai you will know stanley medical college and this was about 30 40 years ago and at that time the the hostel grounds behind stanley were literally a jungle right so this young doctor into his internship while walking towards his duty hours for to the hospital got bitten by a snake he got scared obviously all of us will and he ran to the hospital he reached the hospital collapsed and passed away if he had remained calm and not moved the blood the poison would not have been pumped so fast into his blood stream because he was running the heart was pumping the poison along across his blood stream and you know the the poison spread faster and they couldn't save this doctor although he was inside the hospital compound so the first thing we always tell people in snake bite is remain calm the moment your heart starts beating faster the risk increases okay and call for help immobilize because if you move by like keep doing this then the blood is going to pump so immobilize the bitten arm or leg usually it's arm or leg that gets bitten uh, remove any jewelry because certain snake bites can cause swelling to happen so remove rings bangles which may be there before the swelling starts position the bite below the heart for bleeding we said position it above the heart for snake bites we position it below the heart right so the blood pools in that region and is not pumped up to the heart and then clean the wound and and do a light dressing that's all do we need to put a tourniquet right so tourniquet is a tight bandaid we don't do a tight bandage okay we do a light bandage you can put a tie the tightness should be that your little finger should be able to squeeze through should be able to squeeze through the reason is we are only stopping the venous blood supply from going back it's on the outside right so that is what is carrying the poison not the arterial blood so you don't need a tight tourniquet you need a, a reasonable tourniquet where you can squeeze your little finger in no applying ice again same problem again the movies don't cut the wound or try to remove the venom no alcohol no caffeine because it makes your heart beat faster and then pushes the venom faster and don't try to capture the snake <laughs> all right so when i as an emergency doctor and i know why i'm laughing is simply because i used to have people coming in with snake bites to the er and they'll bring the snake imagine me I'm, i'm like dude i'm not treating the snake i just need to treat the person just tell me how the snake looked i don't want to have the snake inside the emergency department right so people have a tendency to capture the snake and bring it just so they can show it to you when i was doing my in, uh, observership in australia there was a, a farmer who came in saying i got bit by a snake so we asked him where and he removed his pants and the snake is still there it's stuck to his skin he walked to the er with the snake still stuck to him and i was like okay this is fantastic luckily for him the snake was non poisonous and snake are a protected uh, snakes are a protected species in australia so he can't even kill it so he had to bring it to the er so that these kind of incidents happen so that's why we say don't capture the snake just remember its shape and color electric shock and i already did uh, speak about this right a little bit so electric shock what happens when you do an electric shock first don't touch that's the first dictum and i have another sad story again with doctors i have a lot of these doctor stories a husband and wife couple they were doctors the woman went into the washroom and then switched on the geyser 
got an electric shock. The husband ran into saver, got an electric shock. Unfortunately, it didn't survive. Okay. I'm sorry, I have these morbid stories, but it, it is being an emergency physician, you always get to see this, right? So look first, don't touch. This is the dictum. And if possible, turn off the source of the electricity and preferably not from the switch, but from the mains, okay? From the mains, if possible, that might be a lot more safer than from the switch because the switch might be the source of the, uh, uh, the you know, shock itself, okay? And if that is not possible, try to move them with a non-conducting object, object like wood or plastic or cardboard. Okay, so you can use one of those to try and push the person away from the source of the shock. So, and usually when people get an electric shock, unless it's a mild shock, they tend to become unconscious. So you check for signs of life. Are they breathing, not breathing? If they're not breathing, start CPR. If they are uh, breathing, then you know just put them in the recovery position. And put the head lower than the legs, because when somebody gets a shock, all the entire blood will pull into the legs. So you put the head below the legs if possible, or raise the legs a little. Of course, don't touch the patient with your bare hands. Don't get near high voltage uh, wires. I stay at least 20 feet away if you know it's a high voltage wire. And don't move the person unless he's in immediate danger because the shock could have also caused some fractures. So don't move him unless he's in immediate danger of further shock. Okay, nose bleeds. And I think we're reaching towards the end now. So nose bleeds, very common. So I, I, as a child, tend to have a lot of nose bleeds, saw a ton of ENT doctors, um, and nothing helped. And thankfully, it stopped on its own, right? As children, we tend to go through these phases. So nose bleeds, what do we do? Sit upward and lean forward. Why? Because then you're making the nose, the blood flow down like this, instead of going in and swallowing. Generally, we do this. Oh, okay, okay, your nose is bleeding. Now, the way is to do this and then pinch your nose. So pinch your nose so that the bleed can stop. Because 80% of the bleeds happen from the front of the nose. 20% happen from the back and they are more dangerous. It's very difficult to treat. Okay? And then just press and hold for 5 to 10 minutes. You can breathe through your mouth and then the bleeding will stop. That's all you need to do. No need to pick or blow the nose or bend down for a, for a little while after the nose bleeding stops. If it is happening after an accident, then you have to see the doctor. And if it's not stopping in spite of, you know, pressing, then we might have to go see the doctor. These are some of the things you have to do for nose bleeds. Diarrhea. I'm sorry, I didn't put a picture there. It would have been unpleasant. So, right. So how do we treat diarrhea? Simple thing. Stop eating and drinking for a few hours. Give your tummy rest. Okay. Drink plenty of liquids, preferably ORS or Electrol if you have access to it. How much electrolyte to drink? Every episode of uh, diarrhea you have, drink one tumbler full, which is about 200 ml, okay? Of ORS. If you don't like it so much, then you can just keep sipping it because your body will tell you that you're thirsty. And slowly ease back. And while you're easing back, try to avoid milk and dairy products called caffeine and alcohol because they promote bowel movement. So that will then cause further diarrhea. So dairy products, alcohol, caffeine, cigarettes, Fatty food, they all promote bowel movement. So you try and ease into it. Uh, people from Chennai, of course, their favorite is curd rice. Uh, I'm also from Chennai. Okay. So we like curd rice. Okay. Diarrhea means eat curd rice, this is what we do. Right. And of course, get plenty of rest. Okay. That's quite a bit, I think, that I have covered. I already see some 22 questions on the chat box, uh, um, probably grossly over time. First aid kit, some of the things you must keep ointments. Uh, blanket is written because this is for people who are traveling, you know, by themselves, but not necessarily, but you can keep a cold pack. I, I, I have a lot of shoulder pain today, so I'm, I'm having a cold pack. I have cold packs at home. You can keep disposable gloves, hand sanitizers, band-aids, roll of gauze, tapes, plastic bags is for throwing away the waste, a scissor or tweezer, a flashlight. We don't keep activated charcoal anymore. Activated charcoal is for poisoning, treat, treating poison. Of course, this is a recommendation from the American Red Cross. Um, you can, there are ready-made first aid boxes that come, you can always buy and keep one at home, always. And it's, it's always a good thing to have a first aid kit at home, right? Never a bad thing. It's like having insurance. And personal items, have your regular medications also kept there. Have your emergency phone numbers in case you need, uh, you know, people. And other little things that you might feel are important to keep in your first aid box. You can personalize it as much as possible. Okay, 
<laughs> Dr. Tosi, thank you for this wonderful session. I think all of us have got to learn a lot from this. Uh, so my first question that we would say, like, you know, a lot of our seniors uh, are alone at home. And a lot of, uh, you know, you've mentioned, like, you know, all the mostly like the emergency measures would require them to have somebody else. So what could they, you know, do, like, in case they are alone at home? Right. I mean, how to ensure that in case there is an emergency, there is some way of getting uh, help? Is that what you're asking? Now, see, it depends on whether you're conscious or unconscious. Okay. Now, if somebody is unconscious, they need another person to help them. They cannot help themselves, unfortunately. Right. Uh, but even when you're conscious, there can be situations where you've fallen down, uh, God forbid, and that creates a fracture. And then you're not able to get up and help yourself. So you still need another person to come and help you. Right. These are two difficult situations where we definitely will need help. In today's technology-driven age, we have wearables like uh, an Apple Watch or any of these smart watches which can send out trigger alarms when somebody falls down, right? Mm -hmm. So elder people should get these wearables and keep, and they're not so expensive anymore, right? So you can have them and have these emergency SOS numbers already set in. So when they sense a fall, they, this, these devices will already alert their near and dear ones. So the help will arrive faster. There are also sensors that many uh, uh, institutions are bringing about, which you can keep at home. Uh, I think they're calling it elder care or something like that, which they can use. This is in a situation where you are unable to help yourself. But most of the other common situations are already informed on what you should do. The situations which are more scarier are chest pain, breathing difficulty, and giddiness, right? When these situations happen, the best thing to do is get to hospital. But if somebody has a chest pain, and if they're suspecting, could this be a heart attack, there is something called as a loading dose of medicine that we have, where we use aspirin at a 300 milligram dose. And we tell people to you know keep it at home. If they feel, mm, would this be a heart attack or somebody's high risk of heart attack, then they can take an aspirin. But people who have gas also will have chest pain. So I don't really advise people to keep on popping an aspirin every single time. So it depends on if it is something minor, like I mentioned to you, or if it is something which needs a doctor's attention, and then you have to decide what you need to do. But uh, having these wearables and sensor devices at home is a very, very wise and safe investment to have, right? And, and I think Red Health also wants to tie up with, uh, you know, silver talkies and you know, send an ambulance on call and stuff like that. Okay, not not because I'm here, but probably that that's the they they are not only trying with silver talkies; they are trying with other groups. Too. But I'm here, so you know me. That's that's how it is. Yeah. Thank you so much for answering this. Next, we have a question from Nand Kumar. He said, who should not attempt to give CPR? So if you're um, you're physically not fit, right? And you have something like heart disease, your bones are very frail, your osteoporosis, you should not be giving CPR because the risk to you also increases. Yes. So um, the first dictum in CPR is rescuer safety. So if somebody has heart disease, lung disease, osteoporosis, that's weak bones, don't give CPR. You're going to harm yourself, okay? And CPR is something which you have to regularly practice. So it's easy for you to give. And you always give in the 30 is to two, simply because till 30, you can give. It doesn't strain you much. Then you're taking a break. Then 30, then you're taking a break. Uh, when I'm in the hospital, I give it at 200 and then I have to stop, right? For that, I need to be physically fit. But generally, lay people will say to just do 30, take a break, 30, take a break, and do that. The um, question is from Nidhi. She is asking, what is the rule for deciding whether an ice pack or warm pack should be used for an injury? Oh, well, that's a beautiful question. So for that, uh, I have to tell you what an ice pack will do on, and what a cold pack will do. right? Uh, sorry, a hot pack will do. In an ice pack, reduces the swelling okay so you want to reduce the swelling or not let like somebody falls down and there's an alu potato on the on the forehead then you put an ice pack right and you don't want the swelling to grow bigger 
But if it's painful, like somebody has a bruise, they got hit by something and then it's blue and it's painful. You want to reduce the pain, you use a hot pack, right? That is, there's no swelling, right? Otherwise, what will happen? The hot pack will increase the swelling because it causes vasodilatation, right? So generally, the safer thing is a cold pack, right? So it reduces swelling also, kind of makes you forget the pain for a little while. But hot packs are good when there is a spasm, uh, there's no swelling, then there is a bruise, and you want to just reduce the pain, then a hot pack is good. But remember, it should not be a boiling hot pack because then you'll get skin burns, okay? It should just be a warm pack. That's the idea. Does that answer the question? Yes. Thank okay. you so much. Our next question is from Saras. Uh, movement, exercise, analgesics, and treatment. Is this now the replacement for rights? Movement, analgesics, exercise, and? Treatment. Treatment. Yes. <laughs> I, I will respectfully disagree. <laughs> uh, let me tell you why I disagree. Okay. Um, you're right. We do encourage movement post injury, but not when the pain is still there. When you move, when the pain is still there, you're going to aggravate the pain. You have to give yourself about 48 hours of rest and then you start the movement because they're right. The longer you take to start your movement, the more stiff your joints become. So movement is good for us, but not when there is pain. Okay. Uh, it's Think of it as an investment, right? You are investing in your health. You have to wait for some amount of healing to happen before you can then start withdrawing from it. Okay. Or rather, I mean, saying get putting effort on your muscle. So you have to give it rest and then you have to start your movement. That's, that's the idea. So, you know, the whole point becomes moot when you say at the end there is treatment. And I'm wondering then what was the remaining three? Okay. So the idea is, you know, you should try what rice is all about not having to use medications, right? Rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Beyond that is, of course, treatment. Was, was, that, was that okay? Yes, I hope, Saras, that has answered your question. Our next question is from Sujata. Why unprovoked bites are higher risk for rabies? Well, animals are gentle creatures, right? Animals are not running around every day thinking, I'm going to bite you. Okay, otherwise we'll not have pets at home. I'm talking particularly about dogs. And even tigers and lions don't, don't hunt until they're hungry. Okay, but and, and that too, they only hunt human beings if they have had a taste of man flesh. Uh, so if there is a dog and you've not provoked and they just out of the blue come running and bite you, that means there's a high risk that they're infected with rabies. And why is it that we're thinking? Rabies is a neurovirus. It goes to the brain, okay? And it changes behavior. So it changes a dog's behavior to start behaving very aggressive um, and, you know, biting um, everyone. In, in um, Tamil, we say very nigh, right? So that that is the problem. So unprovoked bite, we are always worried about it. Yeah. We Thank have you, another Mr. question MR. from Saras. Should you keep an AED at home? If you want to, it costs about uh, 80,000 rupees. If you don't mind the cost, you can keep it at home. No worries. It's a uh, great, great uh, you know, medical life saving equipment to have at home. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I can't say don't have it at home. It, it is definitely going to save lives. So you can have it at home. It's just the cost. If you're okay with the cost, you can buy it. And, and keep it at home. We try to offset the cost-benefit ratio by saying of the large number of people in a certain region, buy one AED for that entire region. That's the idea. Like you can, if you live in a colony or a, an apartment complex, yes, the apartment complex can have an AED for everybody. That would be the idea. All right. Uh, next, Anju has a question. Uh, any offline first aid course you can recommend? I'm sure a lot of hospitals and different people do it. I don't think they do it this comprehensively, but um, you know, long back St. John's Ambulance used to do it, but nowadays it's more like a, like either a social endeavor or a a publicity uh, thing that people do it. Like hospitals and healthcare organizations, they go into communities and then they do these courses, right? Of course. Um, the American Heart Association 
and the Indian Resuscitation Council and the Society for Emergency Medicine. They also run their basic life support programs. It's a paid program. They give you a certificate, but they don't do first response. So I have mixed both basic life support and first response today for you. They do first response separately and basic life support. And then you pay them a fee of anywhere between 750 to 1200 rupees. And then you can uh, get a certified certification for this. It is possible, yes. Okay. Uh, next, we have a question from Homai. She is saying, do we need a prescription for aspirin? Uh, no. Yay. <laughs> you don't need a prescription for aspirin. No, okay. I, they, they really wouldn't mind. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Jangunath wants to know a little bit about Red Emergency Service and is it available at all places? Oh, so, it's Red is an ambulance service, right? Um, it is strongest in Hyderabad because that's where they started off and in Bangalore. They don't have a lot of presence in Chennai, uh, but it's, it's uh, Hyderabad, Bangalore, Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata is where they are currently present and expanding across the country. So they are in about 16 cities across the country and they are working on a model where they run with their own ambulances, but also they tie up with local operators so that the reach increases. And what is the benefit when they tie up with local operators? They come with their own quality standards and they tell them, you know, please maintain these quality standards and we will put you on our dispatch engine and we'll try to do a timely dispatch rather than phone karo, call karo, you know, guide them. No. So here it is, phone call, the response time is two seconds, and then they try to arrange an ambulance for you as early as possible, depending on how um, well connected they are in that region. Like I said, Tamil Nadu, very poor connectivity for them. But a lot of other places in India, they have a lot of good connectivity that they have. They also take over uh, ambulances from hospitals and run them for the hospitals. For instance, in Chennai, uh, Red runs Vijay Hospital's ambulance. In Hyderabad, they run all the major chains starting from Apollo, uh, Kim's Care, Medicaur, and so on. Bangalore, they're doing Apollo, Manipal, uh, NH, and so on. So they also take over hospitals, ambulances, and then they run them. So they are trying to build India's 911. And that's what excited me. And I said, as an emergency physician, I said, this is nice. Because I spent... Uh, 20 years of my life building emergency departments and training programs and so on. I'm very proud today that all good hospitals have great emergency departments. When I started practicing emergency medicine, uh, Government of India did not even recognize it as a course. So we had a big fight. We got it recognized in 2009. And, and today, all, all hospitals worth their salt have emergency departments. So now we are completing the circle by also ensuring uh, there's good pre-hospital care. That's the idea. A little bit of self publicity. <laughs> I'm joking. Mm -hmm. All right. I think next question by Aparna is: uh, Is there a way to distinguish chest pain due to gas versus heart issue? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> Unfortunately, gas can mimic uh, the symptoms of a heart attack and vice versa. Um, so the best thing for you to do is do your preventive health checkups. Know whether you're at risk for a heart attack or not. Um, like I keep saying, I have checked my in-laws. By God's grace, they're not at risk for heart attack. So now when they say chest pain, I'm relatively relaxed uh, rather than what I would have been if I didn't know that because they're also getting on in their years. So always it's a high alert situation. But because I know I've done the checkups, I know I'm very comfortable when they complain of such things. Yeah. Uh, so we have a next question from Maya where she says UNICEF promoted rehydration souls, eight level eight level teaspoons of sugar plus one level teaspoon of salt mixed in one liter of boiled cooled water. This was for rice water stools. I presume this is still advisable. Absolutely. That's the original ORS, right? Those were the days of uh, cholera uh, where people were dying left, right and center. Very interestingly, one dose of antibiotic can save a life in cholera. But the dehydration with even one episode of uh, loose stool is so severe that people used to die. Right? They used to pass liters and liters of uh, uh, stools. So what uh, Maya is saying, hi Maya, you're missing me in Bangalore. So what Maya is saying is that um, 20 grams of sugar, one teaspoon of salt, a pinch of lemon is a great ORS solution. That's what we originally was the ORS until we became, we went into factory manufactured ORS. Okay. So that's still, that still holds good. 
And our last question that we have is from Sujata. Are there signs for a stroke coming on? Yes, um, there are, right? Uh, a stroke can sometimes happen without any signs, unfortunately. But sometimes it can give you signs like uh, blurring of vision, uh, slurring when you're talking, uh, headache, severe headache can happen, giddiness, right? These happen before uh, they have weakness in the limbs or the face, right? So before the motor weakness sets in, these other symptoms can come. And we have to be really, really careful of these symptoms like headache, uh, giddiness, blurring of vision, slurring of speech. These are all very significant uh, symptoms for stroke, which we have to watch out for. Okay. Uh, there's another question. Okay. Uh, so Nidhi is asked, what should one do when symptoms of stroke are noticed? What to do when some? Rush to the hospital. Time is brain. There is no choice. I, I, I am not joking about this, right? When you get to a hospital within three hours, we can break the clot. We can try to reverse the stroke. If you reach the hospital beyond four and a half hours, unless you can afford to spend about seven or eight lakhs, which is where I can go inside the artery, really going to start thinning process and wait and see. Okay. For a heart attack, you have a six hour window. For a stroke, you have only a three hour window. And a heart attack, you can extend a six hour window to 12 hours. Whereas for you get to a hospital and start the treatment, the better it is. So time is brain in stroke and time is muscle in heart attack. Okay, so and, and there is something called as be fast that we always say when there is a stroke. How do you know there is signs of stroke? So you look for, you put your arms out like this and look for arm drift. One side of the arm is not staying straight and it's drifting. You look at that, you look for slurring uh, of, of, of speech that can be there. You could look for drooping of the eyelids that can be there. So these are some signs of stroke, which early stroke, which you can recognize. You can, you can Google be fast stroke and you will you will see that. Thank you so much. And next is a Kanchana's question. If in a medical checkup, calcium score was high, after a year of medication, should tests be repeated? Well, if you're expecting the calcium score to go down, that may not happen, right? Because calcium is a fixed deposit. But if you want to check and see if it is increasing, then you can do the test. That's, that's the idea. If it's already high, you might actually want to go and do an angiogram and see if you need to do something about it. That would be the plan. Uh, Kanchan, I hope that has answered your question. And I think that was... Uh, I mean, we've... To more, elaborate that more, so if there's a high calcium score, go to the cardiologist, get an angiogram. If you need an angioplasty, get it done. And then you come back next year to do the calcium score to see if there is any fresh deposit. Because by then you've broken it down. But if you've not done any treatment for it and you're just doing blood thinners, uh, it will not reduce. But yes, if you're maintaining a healthy lifestyle, it may not also increase. If that's what you want to check. Hi, sorry. I just have a quick question, Dr. Tosif Nadi here. Hi, Nidhi. I will charge you money for this. <laughs> Please do. When I come to Hyderabad, we'll pay you it all. <laughs> okay, so one quick question. You know, I think uh, one of the objectives for uh, asking for this session was primarily keeping in mind people who are staying alone, right? So, uh, as you said, uh, some of these things can be handled by people alone if they are conscious. And if they are unconscious, of course, uh, there is nothing that much one can do. But I was also wondering that are there any best practices uh, that you recommend in terms of, say, you know, simple things like uh, keeping emergency numbers handy or keeping, uh, you know, having a note of your uh, blood group and your allergies and what medications are you on, right? Uh, so what are your recommendations for those best practices? And are there any guidelines which are the best practice guidelines in terms of uh, where should these, that like almost like a chart kind of a thing, should be placed so that it's accessible? What kind of a support system can you build around yourself? Uh, so any thoughts on that? 
I, I can send you something that I made, but mm -hmm. there's no particular chart that exists. I'm sure there will be, uh, you know, people like yourself who are also already working on it and they may have created a chart like this. But I, when I was doing the first aid kit, I already talked about regular medications and common phone numbers. This is very, very important. In today's day and age, it's also about whether you have health insurance or not. Mm -hmm. And who's your doctor that we need to take you to? Um, and in the hospital, of course, doctor and hospital. So these are some things we want to know. Plus, medically, yes, the blood group is correct, but also your pre-existing medical conditions that may be there. Because as an emergency doctor or as a doctor by gen in general, uh, some pre-existing medical conditions will change the way I treat somebody, right? Uh, compared to somebody who doesn't have those medical conditions. So these are some uh, things that have to be there. Uh, if you want, I can send you a list. And if you want to make a silver talkies document, as a best yeah. practice guide, that's your call. That would be very, very helpful because that's the most common question that's always on my mind that, you know, in case there's an emergency, how do you really kind of get into action with all these basic information in place? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Let me see if I can help you. Sure. Okay, I think, yeah, in terms of questions, we've come to the end of questions. So thank you so much. And yeah, we do really hope that, uh, you know, the conversation that we've been having with Red Health for a tie up uh, for Silver Talkies members uh, that will come through uh, soon. So I'll keep in touch with you for that and Ricky as well. So thank, thank you. you so much, everyone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And thank All you, right. as always, for doing this for us. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure, pleasure. Hope it was useful for everybody. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. Thank All you. Right. Thank Have you, everybody. Day. Bye. Have a good evening. Yeah. Bye.